thank you so much, um, Alex, for the warm introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's a pleasure to, to share uh, some of what we're about with you. Um, before we start, I'm going to be scripted. Otherwise, we'll be here until 5 o'clock. So growing up on a coffee farm in Brazil, I up on a coffee farm in Brazil. I was two years old when I had my very first cup of coffee. <laughs> two years old. This is no joke. Uh, it, it is what we call café con leite. That means that much of raw milk and this tiny bit of very, very sweet coffee. So being the nation that produces and consumes the most coffee in the world, Coffee is free everywhere. You go to a gas station and you get coffee. You go to your dentist and you get free coffee. It's just mind bending. So it's fair to say that I kind of took coffee for granted. It wasn't until 2008 when I moved to New York City that I really started enjoying coffee differently. Um, I kind of fell in love with the idea of a going to cafes and uh, spending time just talking to people. It's the thing that the, cof the cafe culture really, really had an impact in my life back then. So the idea of sitting somewhere, just watching people going by, like talking to a friend for hours and hours, and just uh, coffee after coffee. It was then that I stopped putting sugar in my coffee, no more sweet coffee. and I really understood what quality coffee could be. And from then on, I started taking every single class and every workshop I could on everything coffee. And I finally realized, I really want to work with coffee. That makes sense to me somehow. So in the summer 2014, by then I had finally met the person of my life, the most inter interesting person ever. Um, and then on. And then on her birthday, a few months later, we decided to go to New Orleans. And as one of her gifts, um, I got her a session with a very famous local um, fortune teller. By the way, I'm not superstitious at all, but my wife really is. <laughs> and by the end of that session, we kind of realized that, well, it's time to leave New York. Uh, how about we? go after some new adventures. A little time go by and we move to the land of coffee. We're, I'm back to Brazil. My wife now that barely speaks a word in Portuguese then is in Brazil with me. And we moved to Minas Gerais. Um, Minas Gerais, just to give you an idea, is the biggest producing um, area of coffee in the world. They produce 25% of coffee consumed in the world. It's a lot of coffee. There's regions and there's uh, areas itself. They're the size of Newtown. There's only you find only offices devoted to trade to the trade of coffee. So it's very very interesting, uh, but at the same time very intimidating. Uh, it's full of uh, agents, full of brokers. It's the different side of the industry that I and, and that I knew nothing about it. So I felt. I felt a little uh, scared with the whole thing, let's put it that way. And uh, I didn't feel good about it, to be honest. But then I finally catch a break. Um, I, met a, I met a farmer at a local um, coffee trade show. And we just start talking. And he invites me over to visit his farm in Spirito Santo, which is the next state over. So we drive down to this place, and we go, go down to this valley, to his farm. And it's hard to put a, put a picture into words itself or into a feeling. But when we drove down, we realized, wow, this place, this place is amazing. Um, and it was really, really, really interesting to get to know his family and all the farm itself. Keep in mind, they're not, your very, they're not your stereotypical farmer. They're very savvy. They're very well business oriented. 
and they knew there were way there there could be some more in the coffee industry they could, they could explore if they only work for the right people. So, um, so really, if you if I really think about it, it was them their idea to invest in me and asking me to work with them that really um, struck me. Um, and asking to work for them was one of, the best, one of the biggest privileges of my life. So we packed our bags again, and we moved from Minas Gerais to Espirito Santo. In the beginning, I was in charge of business development. Uh, what that means was that I was trying to get their coffee direct from the farm straight to the roasters. We wanted to get rid of all the middlemen in between. And um, by doing that, we could get a higher price, a higher premium for the coffee itself. There I met some of the most interesting people working in the coffee industry. So we have Eduardo there on the right, or your left, actually. And we have Adelph in the middle, and have Wagner, uh, for instance. Those are people that know everything that I can think of uh, when it comes to coffee production. And they share, they share, they share their love and their knowledge immensely with me. So it was with them that I learned the ins and outs of production. It was how hard it is to produce a good quality coffee, how labor intensive it is. It's fair to say that nine to five is not really a thing there and how costly machinery can be. And, and yeah, crop management can be so expensive as well. Imagine working on something that you won't see the benefit of it for nine months. Cash flow can be the, your worst enemy. And yet, that's why getting paid properly should not even be a question for those people. So they're investing so much, but who really is investing in them? It's hard to sell your product without relying on the traditional dynamics of the, of the industry, you know, all the middlemen's agents, brokers, as I mentioned before. Um, you have to sell locally. You have to rely on a local price. And there's a very interesting thing about the coffee industry. Um, as a, as a farmer, you used to, to get your price dictated by the buyer. It's, I find that very weird. So this is a very interesting, exer interesting exercise, actually. So the journey from farm to table, we're talking about one kilo of coffee. So here, myself as a farmer, I then sell to a local broker. This is one kilo of coffee at 186 pounds per kilo. Then the local broker will sell to a local agent for 214. It gets better. Then you need the exporter to then sell that coffee all over the world. And the exporter then will sell the coffee for 289. Oh, sorry. Wrong button. Sorry, Alex. Okay, sorry, recapping. Broker to the farmer 186. Again, me as a farmer, I'm happy that he's paying 186 most of the time. So agent then pays 214, and then exporter, big companies, they pay 289. Then we have the importer here on the Europe, European side, or even in America, Asia, anywhere. They pay 361. So it's getting clogged, but that's just how it works for the whole industry, pretty much. I want to say like 95% of the industry works that way. And then, in your local rollster, buys that coffee from the importer, they pay 487 per kilo. Of course, everyone have their costs here, everyone has their margin, everyone has to make 
money. It's, it's just the industry. So the roster itself, again, sorry. <laughs> it should be one button here. <laughs> Back and forth. Sorry, Alex, thank you. I'm doing this the way you make sure you understand. <laughs> so, so I got the roster. And uh, the roster paid eight, uh, 487 for the price of one kilo of coffee to the importer. Make sure I put tapes on the other buttons. So as a cafe, then this cafe would pay around uh, 16 pounds per kilo. Uh, and of course, cafe is one of the most, one of the hardest part of the whole thing here because there's a lot, a lot of overheads running a cafe. Right, Catriona? We have a, someone from cafe, from cafe side here. So then you, with one kilo of coffee, you can get pretty much like 50 espressos, double shots. And that's how much it costs 50 espressos on a, on a cheap place, actually, 110 pounds a year. So we're talking about 186 to 110 pounds. And when you show that to a farmer, when you show that to someone that produces coffee for nine months, and often they wait 45 days to get paid after they ship their coffee, that they're like, whoa, it's very interesting. But it's just the way how the industry works. So it's fair to say that the opportunity presented itself. What if, what if, we took all those middlemen, all those speculators, all those agents out of the, out of the picture, and we start working with coffee ourselves? Easy, right? Well, kind of. Now, we're roasting coffee. We have, we have amazing farmers that we trust, and we can, pay, we can pay them a higher premium for their coffee because we're getting rid of all those middlemen. I'm Brazilian, so um, I got the, the language skills. My wife is British, so we can come here and set up a business. And in many ways, we're very well positioned. But, again, there's a lot of buts. We're not there yet. You soon realize that every single step that you get out of someone's, someone else's hand, you're taking, you're taking the on yourself. And it gets complicated because then you have, you have to invest in something. And you have to invest a lot of time energy, the learning curve is just huge, and a lot of enthusiasm. And most of all, you have to invest money as well. So let's talk investment. Um, I'm going to break that into three, three parts. They're not equal, but they're very important. And of course, I'm going to talk about money. Um, I know it's not the most exciting thing, but it's very important. It would be romantic, very romantic to stand here and tell you, well, if you invest time, if you have a good plan, if you invest, invest in people, you're all set. It would be romantic. But we live in a capital-driven society, and we depend on money to do a lot of things. And to be honest, if we, if we didn't have savings um, and we, if we didn't have a financial backing from ourselves, it would be very hard to start. And just to give an idea, so now we're roasters. That means that we need equipment. Um, a new coffee roaster is around 35,000 pounds. So that's why you might have to take a risk and fly to Iceland just before Christmas and buy a second-hand machine that, I saw, that you saw on eBay, right? It made sense there. Um, well, it's a risk. Luckily, it turned out to be a great investment and we saved loads of money. Um, a new espresso machine, it's very expensive. Um, a fancy one can be around 15, 
to 20,000 pounds sometimes. So that's why uh, waiting for five months for a local engineer to refurbish your dream machine makes sense. And now, now, so I'm the importer. And uh, I have to buy tons and tons of coffee at once. I cannot just call an importer in London and rely on the traditional um, dynamics of the industry and ask them, oh, can I have two bags of coffee for the end of the week? No, I have to buy at least 13, 15, 20,000 um, kilos of coffee. Just because the logistic cost is so expensive. And just to give you an idea, if I decide to call the farmer tomorrow and ask them for 700 kilos of coffee, it would cost me 5,000 pounds just to get this coffee here. But at the same time, if I wanted to buy 20,000 kilos of coffee, I will use the same container and I still pay 5,000 pounds. So that's, in that, uh, just, no, oh, hello. Oh, yep, totally agree. So to make the logistic part of the issue worth it, you have to at least spend 30,000 pounds of coffee in coffee to buy, uh, to bring it here, I mean. And everything costs money. A website costs money. I bet there's a lot of website developers here. Don't ever tell uh, your friends that you do work for free. Don't, don't do that. So a website costs money. Rent is expensive. You have to buy then, you know, little uh, cute coffee mugs. By the way, it's part of the raffle. You gotta play. <laughs> You have to buy little coffee mugs, and those coffee mugs itself, they're four pounds and 25 each. So everything is money. And we now come to the second part of investing, which is investing time. Really, really important as well. And we asked you all today, uh, earlier on, if you had three years, what would you invest that time in? What would you invest in? And I kind of skipped one, I guess. Hold on. <laughs> I want to make sure you really understand. <laughs> uh, so investing time. So three years. Three years is what it took us to get Santu from an idea to a profitable business. Um, so it took a long time if you think about it, but it flew by. And one other thing that you have to invest a lot of time is uh, production and operations itself. It took time to learn how, on how to roll on our machine. She's 25 years old. It's not a, just like a plug and play kind of thing. Um, you would go and waste batches and batches of coffee. And when I say a batch of coffee, it's 15 kilos. Wasting coffee, wasting coffee, to then realize, well, this is not tasting right. Let's do more testing. And there's one more thing. Being a 25-year-old machine, if you need parts, you have to realize that a lot of those parts being discontinued like over 25, 20 years ago. So it's a, lot of, it's a lot of time investing there. The logistic parts of it as well. Um, how, okay, we have amazing coffee in Brazil, but how do we get that coffee to cross the Atlantic? And um, understanding how the system, how complex and how uh, hard is to export from Brazil to here, you have to then realize all the dynamics of the logistic. And then you have to realize how the dynamics of logistic works here as well as an importer. And it took months and months to then realize and putting a plan together and, and uh, getting that plan into action. One other thing that took a lot of time, it was British culture. Remember, I'm from Brazil. I spent a lot of time in, um, in America itself. We, well, we all people were different. And um, I would approach someone here, and they would say, hmm, I'm not sure. 
which that means, which means is like, nope, it's a no. When a British person say, I'm not sure, it's no. It took a long while to realize that. So, oh, well, that person said, I'm not sure, two weeks ago. I'm going to wait a little bit. I'm going back there. And sometimes it would take 12 visits to then understand, all right, he's, they're just not interested. And, um, well, it's one of the learning curves, I guess. But once everything was running perfectly, still took five months to get a, a standing order, a, a, a client that would trust us to the point that would buy a lot of coffee. And our very, our very major, um, our major, our first major standing order was Cafe Milk. Uh, big shout out to those guys. They like have, they have like five shops in the city. Um, they really liked us from the beginning. They really understood the story. And um, we're very thankful that they took on our early and uh, helped us a lot in the beginning. So again, five months coffee sitting here in a warehouse. And we machinery working and everything. No more wasted batches. And by going around, you notice that uh, a, fl a few places, a few coffee shops, they just don't have the coffee as their main top priority. And um, they have a lot of things to worry about. They have staff not showing up. They have food going bad. Um, they have an awful landlord that's trying to raise the rent or anything like that. And, and um, just to name a few problems with the coffee shop in, um, itself, I would walk in expecting everyone, oh, coffee, sell me all your coffee, give me more. But no, a lot of time, a lot of times I was just another salesperson with free samples. And it's just, okay, fair enough. We realized we had to get them really involved. Uh, we had to, and the best way to do that, we thought like, oh, let's get them to the workshop. And at the workshop we could then talk to them the way I'm talking to you now. Then most of the time they'll buy into the, the store and start working with us. So as we stand on those slides here, um, I think we, I get now to the most, to the third and most important part of the of an investment and um, it's investing in people. So we have farmers. There's more farmers, actually. Do, 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 do. Let's go back. Do, do. So we have amazing farmers. Uh, the one to your left is Eduardo. Eduardo Tosi is the one who um, is the one who hired me to work on his farm. Uh, that's the reason we moved to Espirito Santo. Very, very interesting guy. Been farming. Um, he turned his farm around uh, over 10 years ago. And uh, he's, he has a vibe of, of a sort of Californian dude, and like sort of surfer, very cool, very chill. But it takes, it takes him a while. Uh, it, to, it, it will take you a while to earn, uh, earn, earn his respect. But once you do, he'll do anything for you. It's such an amazing friend, like, amazing uh, partner as well. Um, his family has been uh, producing coffee at the same, in the same farm for over 140 years. And their, their farm is called Sitio Floresta, which in English uh, means uh, forest farm. It's called Sitio Floresta because 75% of the farm is dedicated uh, to the, uh, protecting uh, the, for, uh, the Atlantic forest, which is a very, very interesting um, thing that not many farmers do. So kudos to him and his family. And then we have uh, Adelfo Casagrande. Adelfo Casagrande is a very interesting guy. Um, when I was talking to Alex, uh, Alex a little while ago about him, I personally call him Mr. Sunshine. Uh, he is the kind of person that will put a smile on your face just the way he says hello. Uh, he's very enthusiastic, very, very upbeat. A lovely family guy. He, he's been producing coffee for a while as well, but 
not just coffee. His farm produces everything from strawberries to oranges to avocados. And by the way, avocados in Brazil, they're, they're not a tiny bit like this. They're the size of my head. <laughs> and speaking of avocados, avocados are the, the trees that he uses for shading coffee. So all the coffee one that he had there is shaded by avocado trees. It's a very interesting thing. So we're back to Brazil last November, and we get to meet new people. There were new farmers that have really liked the idea of working directly with us. And uh, one of the, those farmers is Jacqueline, this young lady here. Uh, Eduardo then told, told us about her, and um, she's 20 years old. She's been helping her father, Zezé, transitioning um, their farm from commodity. Commodity is the kind of coffee that we, use, that we drink at Starbucks or Costa, to specialty coffee, to higher grade coffee. So it's their very first year producing specialty coffee. Just to give you an idea, for the last two years, she's been spending her nights, not just working all day, her nights, going to a local coffee institute and taking every class that, can, that she can think of in, on everything coffee. And she gained a lot of attention in the area because uh, one thing that she does a lot is experimenting. She experimented with a lot of different processes in coffee. And that um, itself, when we try her coffee, it's like, wow, this is really interesting. This is really, really, really delicious. So we are lucky enough uh, to start working with her. And um, in May, our, our next shipping when it's coming, you're going to have the opportunity to try her coffee. So we're very excited about that. So she's one of the main young farmers um, that have been working hard to turn around the industry. Because it's very common for a young person in a family, in a farming family, to leave the farm and go to the city. And if there's not enough investment in the farming industry itself, what's the re why those kids would stay? So you have to invest in them somehow. But anyway, who would not invest in them? They're amazing people. And because the way Sant we set up, um, with no middlemen, we're able to pay, to pay these farmers up to 120% more. Should I get back to those slides back there? <laughs> so we're able to pay them up to 120% more of their local um, of their local market. And by doing that, we we're certain we're helping uh, them to invest in their farms and keep on thriving for generations and generations. So we talk about the farmers and capping on about people. We also had the Edinburgh crew here at the Edinburgh side. I realized early on in life that if we invest in people and if we invest in coffee, give them coffee. You make a lot of friends. Just by sharing your passion and to start seeing people getting behind the idea, conversation will start. And before we knew it, we had a community. Lots and lots of people um, started helping us somehow. Um, we have Matt, which is our new employer. New employee, actually. He's an amazing person, loves coffee. Um, we have Hus, we have Alex, an amazing barista, very young, who would help me to understand the dynamics of coffee um, in Scotland itself. We have Amber from the Amazon Development Center. We have the guys at Company Bakery, Fabricio, Andy and Jules, Colin, Mike, Catriona. We have Sam and have Eyewear, Chloe, Darina from Kimpton um, Hotel. Scott Lauer from Fiora Restaurant. We have Sashana from um, Edinburgh Food Studio. We have uh, the guys from Milk, Pastry Section, Oko, just to name a few. Um, I, I could be here like naming people forever. Uh, those are clients or friends and just people that really like the story and helped us here. So close to home now. Uh, if you're lucky enough 
to have a business partner or a romantic partner. Or in our case, both. My wife is my business partner, but of course, my romantic partner. To help you out. You then realize that you have to invest in each other. Because uh, starting a business can be very stressful. Supporting one another when we're paying yourself less than minimum wage just to get your business off the ground. So that way you can have more, co more money and more coffee. Um, on your business account somehow to then buy more coffee. It's hard to take a vacation, for instance. Um, and when it's cold for six months, I don't mind the cold, I mind the gray. So when it's gray for six months, and then you realize, well, we could have been living in Costa Rica instead of Scotland. So you need a lot of support. And you gotta remember what you invest in it, which is the future. Not just the two of you, but the future of those people as well. And they somehow choose to be on this journey with us and we're really proud of that. So knowing that I'm passionate, knowing that I'm passionate about, uh, about this for a reason, that is this beautiful place where they have been producing coffee for over 140 years and will continue to thrive just because somehow we invest in each other. I know that we have a, a role to play in that. And I believe that's, cause, that's because they invested in me first. And I'm very, very happy for that. Thank you, guys. A kilo of coffee? That's a very good question. Uh, do you, Aaron, do you, do you mind help me out? I know. <laughs> very, very, very important question. A lot of farmers don't have the financial uh, savviness of knowing how much it costs the co uh, to produce the coffee itself. Uh, just to, just to give you a rough idea, it takes three years and a half for a coffee to start producing. Uh, and within that time, you have to invest on, on, on the plants itself. It's the crop management is very expensive. And let's put it that way, they don't keep bookings. They don't have accountants. Um, unless you're a very well-organized farmer, then you realize how much really cost a, uh, a kilo per coffee. But just to answer your question in a, in a simple way, it costs around a, a pound to a pound 25 to produce uh, one kilo of coffee. And if the coffee is very high graded, which it requ it requires a lot more labor, and you produce very little of that, it can be up to five pounds per kilo to produce that coffee. Thank you. I had a question for the well, other two panelists as well. Um, I think what was what we really got out of having all these events and discussions that we had was that we were saying the idea for us as a consumer and as Chris, I was saying, why would you be creating these and then not buy it or whatever if we go into uh, the cow wanting to say milk men um, and milk? Um, contribute to that one. Thank you, Aaron. So, what, sorry, what exactly is the question? <laughs> the main question is the rest of the buying the coffee is not a big business for them, right? Whether it is you take it out to the cafe or you bring the coffee on the driver. Well, we've heard a lot of farmers let down sometimes before and it just got better. So, what was happening on the other side? Like, who's the, who's the consumer? I don't know if you've got your thoughts about that. I don't know who's getting more. I, I would say that. Um, all cafes have high overhead, whereas I can tell you it, it is really expensive. You've got um, you've got staff, you've got a lot of costs. Um, we would always say try and in, 
in the same way that I think we're all trying to be more conscious in the way that we um, buy food or other choices we make, like think about where you're going, especially because we're so lucky living here. There are so many amazing um, cafes, but I, th I think there's a tendency to, um, to go for what you know or to, or to want something that's very... Um, very reliable like you're not going to get a bad coffee at a specialty coffee shop it's going to be amazing so you, you should definitely I would encourage everyone to try and remember to, to do that and to, um, to support local cafes but it, it is um, it is a very complex industry and I, I think we're, we're sort of conscious of not um, putting down Starbucks and Costa and places like that because I think we've done a really good job of, of educating people and moving us all away from like the best cafe so I think that that's you know that's that's a step in the right direction. But I think now that we're all our palates are becoming more educated, that we can hopefully take the next step and, and start supporting local businesses too. But I mean, I'm not I don't hate Starbucks. No, much. <laughs> no, definitely not. Any more questions? Yeah. Don't you get the next one? Can you, can you get depends. again? Depends. Hello, depends on. Um, thank you. Great talk from you both. Thank um, you. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the reason for that, uh, I managed uh, I managed two restaurants in New York and cafes and worked as a barista in a lot of places. Um, there's one thing that I don't miss, which was Friday night. I'm home already, and someone, a barista, would call me. Oh, more so, um, I cannot make my shift on much more morning. You would know why this person is partying hard. Um, so it's one of the hardest part. And but one other thing, there's no there's no time off when you're running a cafe. You're constantly thinking of it. It's 24/7. It's uh, it's really really uh, it's draining in terms of time. But yeah, I I love it's it's very romantic. But when it comes down to it, I prefer uh, five days a week. <laughs> just that we're worth shy it's also <laughs> <laughs> we do love I, I think it's really nice as a local because we can get to work with so many different cafes hotels businesses you know we, we supply white space we supply the amazon office here loads and loads of, of different diverse people individuals companies um and th they've all got different needs and i think there's there's such a pleasure for us and bringing in the different coffees and different people roasting it in different ways that we wouldn't be able to do if we just had one shop and we were doing things just one particular way. So I think it's it's quite fun for us that we get that diversity of working with loads of different people as well, as well as getting weekends off, which is nice. <laughs> sure. One last one. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk a bit about how you sort of found the process Uh, the last part of it, the farmer's end. So it's the farmer's cooperative, where they all sort of work together. Great. How many of those sort of middleman steps were made? Uh, how did you do that step by step? It's a very good question. Uh, co ops. Co ops, um, how can I put this? It's a very good way to organize knowledge, to organize uh, expenses, and share everything. And there's amazing co ops in Brazil uh, that do beautiful uh, work. Uh, one thing that they can get rid of right away, it's a broker and a local agent. The co-ops are the exporter already. But there's still, uh, there, there, there's still farmers that have some resentment about uh, co-ops, because a lot of co-ops, they ask for a fee, a, a annual fee, or you have to commit your production to only sell to them. You're still selling to someone. And a lot of co-ops ask you for up to five years commitment. Um, and for a farmer to commit their work up to five years to someone, they kind of gambling with the idea that the price could not be so good later on or could be way better and they could get a better price somewhere else. So it's sort of catch-22, but the co-ops tend to pay a lot uh, more for coffee than a broker itself or the agent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how did you get the coffee roaster back to Iceland? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't covered in Ryanair's baggage. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it was, it, it, they, they want to charge me too much uh, to bring. Um, so, make sure to Iceland, that's 18th of December. Um, this older guy pissed me up at the airport, he's 72. He got the machine in California, he's a, pro, uh, he's a um, mathematician, he's a prof he was a professor actually, uh, teaching in California. So he then fell in love with coffee as well, brought the machine back to Iceland and opened a, ca a cafe, sort of a coffee roaster as well. He was using the machine very little. So for 20, 20 odd years, his family grew up with the machine. And when we shook hands, he cried because it was such an important piece of thing of his life, in his life. And all right, so now I'm back to Edinburgh. We have a machine in, um, in Iceland that we paid for it already. How do we get it here? Logistics, you call people, you call companies. But that's, that's the thing that I don't get about the industry very often. It's um, that there is people out there willing to help you. Why they wanna help you? Because they want your business. So if you call a logistic company, they'll be like, oh, all right, if you do this, you send me this uh, piece of paper, you send this, you send that, I'll help you out, it'll cost that much. And a, a week later, the coffee machine was here. That simple. Amazing, that's all we have time for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you.